Keith Feldman has the role of following the chancellor. He is an assistant professor in the Department of Ethnic Studies and affiliated faculty with designated emphasis on both women, gender, and sexuality and critical theory. He received his PhD in English from the University of Washington in 2008 and joined the Ethnic Studies faculty the following year. He is currently completing his first book entitled Special Relationships, Israel, Palestine, and U.S. Imperial Culture. Welcome to Lunch Home. Uh, good afternoon. The uh, intimidating uh, joys of alphabetical order. Uh, thank you. Thanks for the invitation. I'm incredibly honored to be here and to share this lectern uh, with so many uh, wonderful uh, colleagues today. So I wanted to read uh, a brief excerpt of a much longer poem uh, that I was introduced to uh, nearly 15 years ago uh, in advance of a, a semester-long study as an undergraduate uh, in Jerusalem and Al-Quds. Uh, and it's a, uh, it's a poem that I continue to think with and I really feel has uh, uh, animated me uh, into the kind of scholarship that I'm, uh, I've been embarking on. It's a it's a poem by the uh, important Palestinian poet Mahmoud Darwish uh, entitled Dakira Lil Nisyan, uh, uh, in English, Memory for Forgetfulness. Uh, it was translated by uh, Ibrahim Muhawi uh, and published by UC Press, uh, our very own, in English uh, uh, in 1995. Uh, now, the poem is uh, kind of a, a prose poem uh, about the poet's small acts of survival uh, in and around his apartment in Beirut uh, during a single day of the Israeli Air Force's intense military intervention into civil war in August 1982. And so, of course, it's timely. Uh, and for better or worse, it always seems rather timely. Uh, the poem begins with an epigraph uh, from the French critic Roland Barthes. Uh, translated into English, it is, it's precisely because I forget that I read. So I'll read a, a really brief excerpt from Memory for Forgetfulness. Gently place one spoonful of the ground coffee, electrified with the aroma of cardamom on the rippling surface of the hot water, then stir slowly, first clockwise, then up and down. Add the second spoonful and stir up and down, then counterclockwise. Now add the third. Between spoonfuls, take the pot away from the fire and bring it back. For the final touch, dip the spoon in the melting powder. Fill and raise it a little over the pot, then let it drop back. Repeat this several times until the water boils again, and a small mass of the blonde coffee remains on the surface, rippling and ready to sink. Don't let it sink. Turn off the heat and pay no heed to the rockets. Take the coffee to the narrow corridor and pour it lovingly and with a sure hand into a little white cup. Dark colored cups spoil the freedom of the coffee. Observe the paths of the steam and the tent of rising aroma. Now, light your first cigarette. Made for this cup of coffee, the cigarette and with the, the flavor existence of existence itself, unequaled by the taste of any other, except that which follows love. As the woman smokes now, away the last sweat and the fading voice. I know my coffee, my mother's coffee, and the coffee of my friends. I can tell them from afar, and I know the differences among them. No coffee is like another, and my defense of coffee is a plea for difference itself. No coffee is like another. Every house has its coffee, and every hand, too, because no soul is like another. I can tell coffee from far away. It moves in a straight line at first, then zigzags, winds, bends, sighs, and turns on flat, rocky surfaces and slopes. It wraps itself around an oak, then loosens and drops into a wadi, 
looks back and melts with longing to go to the top of the mountain. It does go up the mountain as it disperses in the gossamer of a shepherd's pipe, taking it back to its first home. Thanks. Thank you.